Michael, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. So we obviously uh, heard you were walking by, uh, walking through Plymouth, and thought we'd grab you to come in for a conversation. So why why are you in the uh, the little dog duke there out for a walk, and why are you passing through Plymouth? So I am out walking the UK coastline to highlight the inequalities of the UK family courtroom. Uh, I started in Sussex, well, Hastings in Sussex on the 8th of July. I have no idea what day it is today, but I'm roughly just shy of a month in. Yeah, it's the 2nd of August now, mate. That's flown by. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> when you flying. wander around the coastlines, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going around, handing out some information on a petition I've got, speaking to people, um, telling them why I'm doing it, because they inevitably ask, because I've got a really cute dog with me. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just to raise awareness of the insane process we're currently calling the family court system. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll get into the detail of obviously that in a second. Um, the actual challenge itself though, so you've obviously been going for a month, started in Sussex, you're now in Devon. Uh, where from here, is it down into Cornwall? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to be leaving Plymouth first thing tomorrow morning heading towards well my end goal for the foreseeable future is land's end mm-hmm. um what i would do is break it down so right once i get there i can worry about the next bit yeah um so yeah me and my friends joining me tomorrow heading down to cornwall and then back up my next end goal will be western supermare okay and then just keep doing that all the way around until my end goal's back in hastings right okay and uh, just just so people are clear, are you literally walking around like the outside. Of the I am UK? walking the the coastline of the UK. <laughs> wow! How long is that going to take? Um, it it all depends um, because I've I've given myself just 366 days is I'd say the least amount of time it would take, and that's on an average of 20 miles a day at roughly three miles per hour, uh, which works really well when you're on a flat, but when you're going through lovely places like. Dorset and here and pretty much everywhere from this point forward and it's all 90% uphill and 10% downhill I don't know how the science behind that works <laughs> but uh, yeah it's, I've slowed down significantly already mm. so I'm probably averaging about 10 miles a day at the minute um, so I've given myself anything between a year and two years to do it hopefully I want to get it done in as quick as possible as much as I'm enjoying it I do have a life to get back to but I think this this, the reason I'm doing it is a lot more important than what I've got waiting for me back home. Yeah, okay. And and do you know how many miles until that is? Have you done the maths on it yet? So, again, depending on how you look at it, it's anything between 9,000 and 11,000. And that includes, so if you look at a map of West Scotland, for example, it can, it's predominantly just loads of little tiny islands. I don't have any intention of island hopping when I get that far because, A, it's going to take forever, and, B, it'll be winter by the time I get there. So I'm going to try and do just mainland Scotland, in which case it's closer to 9,000 miles. But then it's impossible to tell because no one's actually gone around with a tape measure on the country to see exactly how far (laughs) it's going to take, but uh, how long it is, sorry. But uh, yeah, anything between 9 and 11,000 miles. Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content, as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel, and it helps us bring you better guests. And what's the actual walk been like so far? The coast views, have they been nice? The views that I've stopped to look in have been spectacular. And what I mean by that is I usually have my earphones in, my head down, just walking. Trudging, yeah. Because... The pack I'm carrying isn't light by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, well, when you bring it in, man, I was like, <laughs> you know, that's heavy. I was thinking, I'd struggle to walk, carry that around. Mate, when I come in, I was like, guys, we agreed to a podcast. It's not that you could live here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so much stuff. I thought, I thought it was a deal. Come on. You can have a night. You can have a night. <laughs> but no, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it has been nice. I've seen some beautiful places. Like, um, I don't want to make it sound like I'm just going on like a, a tour of the coast because that's not what I'm doing. But the, I'm walking past some stuff. I've had to stop to take it in. Um, it's not Dumbledore Cove. I keep forgetting, forgetting what it is. Durdledor. Durdledor Cove. I, I, I was lucky enough to get there really early in the morning and the beach was dead. So I was like, all right, now's my opportunity. So I just stripped off and jumped in. I had the whole beach to myself. I was like, when would I ever have an opportunity to do this again? 
Um, and then it was immediately taken over by loads of uh, tourists. But anyway, things like that have been fantastic. Um, but better than that is that I've got the chance to actually speak to people. And what I've noticed is once I get to a big city, Plymouth, for example, no one stopped me here because a, a big ginger fat guy with a Bergen on a puppy sticking out doesn't seem to be weird here. <laughs> but if you're walking on the coast when there's no villages and there's no, nobody else there and you walk past an old couple and they're like, what are you doing, mate? They're the people that are stopping and talking to me. And out of everyone I've spoken to, not I've, and I've spoken to thousands of people, yeah. not one person has disagreed with what I'm going for. So that's all the motivation I need to keep going. It's like, well, it's clear that this is a problem. Um, it just takes this guy doing something stupid like this to highlight it. So, yeah. So tell us about that then. So, so why are you so passionate about this cause? So I, I've been through the family court system. Um, it crippled me financially, um, emotionally, physically. Um, it was horrible. Uh, it was two years ago that I finished doing it. But following that, I, um, I came to the conclusions like, right, I'm, I'm just a dad. All I need to do is keep the mum happy. And if I keep her happy, I get to see my kid. So that's what I did for two years. I just shut up and just did whatever she told me to do. Um, I moved from my hometown in Wiltshire to Sussex so that I can be closer to him. Um, I got involved more with his school. I got involved more with everything. And then when I was in a position that I could see my son more, I was like, right, I'm here now. I, I couldn't be more involved. I've kept you happy for two years. I want 50-50. I was then told, if you want 50-50, you need to go back to court. And I, I was like we've done this twice before and both times we ended up in court. Hang on. Uh, the decision was made that I wouldn't see him until the judges decided when I could on her request because of his safety or whatever excuse she gave. Um, so whilst we were doing the court applications, I didn't see my kid both times the first one not as long as the second the second one was nine months the first one was i think six weeks um so why would i go through that process again uh not only that but i contacted my barrister uh and, and she told me basically if i go to court now and it's not urgent it could take up to two years before i even get a response in which case my son will be 10 in that case, he will then be going into secondary school soon and the courts are going to be reluctant to change his routine because he's in secondary school. So what you're basically saying is I'm fucked. Like, there's nothing I can do. I've just got to keep this woman happy forever. No matter what she says, I just have to buckle down and do it. Uh, and I snapped. Um, it was like, I'm not a dad. I, I mean, I am a good dad to my son and I can be. I'm more like a fun uncle he visits occasionally. So when he sees me, we have a great weekend. He doesn't want to go because I'm the fun dad. Um, when he sees me over the long school periods, he doesn't want to leave me because I'm the fun dad, which in turn makes me look bad to the mother. He's like, oh, he only ever sees you as the fun parent. It's like, I don't want to be just the fun parent. I want to be an equal parent. I want to be involved with this school. I want to be involved with his school friends. I want to know more about him, but all I see is the fun stuff. Um, so... I, I, I cracked one day, I, was, I just went out and I was like, you know what, I'm just, there's nothing I can do. Um, and I went to Beachy Head in Sussex with every intention of, of... sorry, hang <laughs> of of not coming back. And um, whilst I was there, I was like, well, he's going to be fine. His mum's a good mum. She's a terrible person, but she's a really good mum. So he's not. he doesn't need me. He'll be fine without me and be fine with her. And then it struck me, I thought, what happens one day if he has kids and he can't see them and he ends up back in the family court? Um, <clears throat> oh, so I decided, well, no, I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, I want to do something about it. I'm sick of people telling me, oh, I know the system's broken, but don't worry, when they're older, <laughs> they'll understand. I was like, when he's older, I won't be able to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do something about it now. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, sorry. <sighs> I don't apologise, mate. It's a real fucking 
couldn't even imagine it. You know what I mean? Like, I'd, I'd be, I'd be the same position. I got a twelve year old, you know, and mm. if I was in your position, it, yeah, it it break my soul too. So don't don't ever apologise for it, mate. Yeah. Do you need a moment, mate? Uh, I'm all right. I'm all yeah. right. Okay, so there's a bit to unpick there, mate. So yeah, I guess where do we start? Because I think, as you say, I think <laughs> there's obviously a, a misconception, I think, for a lot of people that it's funny because obviously I, I imagine this is you purposely being ironic with your TikTok handle, right? Because yeah. a lot mm -hmm. of people just consider dads to be deadbeat dads. Yeah. Um, and I think certainly for me and Danny being that parents, we spoke about it before, but it's like the worst thing we could imagine is like not being able to see our child. And we mentioned offline a second ago, but you know, obviously you just, you just said there, but we know that suicide in men is, is a massive issue. Huge issue. It's the, yeah. the biggest killer of men in the 50. And statistics suggest that as much as 20% of those deaths are related to access to children. So that obviously tells us that it's not men being deadbeat dads. It's men <laughs> having a real fucking challenge trying to get access to their kids. Yeah. And as you say, it's, it's, I think anybody that's been in a relationship and it's broken down, it's, it's really challenging to, to work or yeah. deal with that per person, right? And it feels like there's occasions where women um, will weaponize children. 100%. Against their, against their partners. And I think it's very clear that certainly in, in the UK, I think in the US is very similar as well, where the, the family court system is very leaning towards the mother. And I think in Europe, there's been a couple of countries that have now started to shift in that, where they're starting to give sort of 50, 50 equal rights. But yeah, it, it seems to be a massively biased uh, system um, and, a, and a kind of an absolute nightmare. So mate, I can feel, I feel for you entirely. Um, and I think everybody watching mate will probably feel the same. Um, and I think you came to this revelation, well not a revelation, but realization yourself where like certainly boys, but any kids absolutely need their parents, yeah. both of them, their mum and their dad. Um, so yeah, so I think what you're doing mate is, is remarkable. Um, and that's why we were really keen to get you on and talk to you, mate. Thank I think, you. I think Thank the influence you. a dad can have on his son or daughter, it's, you can't replace that. And I think it's really important. They, people would say, are they, you know, they only need one parent or, you know, it'd be fine with his mum, but they definitely need a, a male role model around. You know, I always feel like my son, you know, if he was just with my wife all the time, he'd be such a soft little shit, you know, <laughs> in the nicest way possible. He would, he would, he would be. And, uh, and that's because she's just, you know, a little bit more, bit more loving, a bit more soft with him. And, you know, if, if he does need a little telling off or he does need to be put in line straight away, she looks at me and I'm like, oi, <laughs> Get in here, do this, you know, and because he's to that age now where he's 12, 13, he's changing a little bit, you know, and I think, yeah, that's, that's really important. Yeah. So let's add a bit more context to this and then we'll, we'll kind of get back to obviously that process in the courts. So are you happy to kind of go back and I guess, tell us about your relationship with, with your child's mother? Sure. Um, like maybe how you guys met, how long you were together for, um, before you had your son? Mm-hmm. What's his name, by the way? His name's Travis. Travis. Yeah. Nice, good name. Strong yeah. name, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so tell us about that, if you don't mind, mate. So uh, I met his mother in um, 2013 at a... Uh, I was serving in the military at the time. Uh, she got invited to one of the mess dues as a guest, and I was working the bar. And I'm not giving you, like, a full, like... Oh, <laughs> yeah. Glittery and stars and stuff, but... Um, I, I, yeah, we, we we didn't actually. We started talking, and then we got together in early 2014. She had two kids already from a previous relationship, um, and uh, I got on all right with them. Okay. And then um, there was there was a plethora of red flags at the time. But at the time, this is 2014. Red flags wasn't a cool hip thing. Back then. <laughs> um, but there was a few things that made me raise an eyebrow. And this is a little weird. Um, Oh, he's going on about her ex. Oh, he's the worst person ever. He's a narcissist. First time I'd ever heard the word narcissist, by the way, is by her. So I've got to thank her for that to some degree because I didn't even know what it meant before I met her. Um, always bad mouth in him. And I'd never, like, stuck up for him. I was always remained neutral with it. I was like, well, whatever. I don't know the guy. Anyway, um, we, uh, we, we, we got together. I was, we were actually a long-distance relationship. So I moved to Surrey to uh, 
with, with the army and she stayed in Swindon. And uh, we carried on and then she got pregnant one day. But we'd actually split up just before I found out she was pregnant um, because I found out that she got on with my best friend a lot more than I initially anticipated. But um, it was my best friend that told me, like, he didn't have any idea. He was like, by the way, this has happened. I was like, okay, well, this is over. But then it turns out she she was pregnant, so I forgave her. Um, which is on its on its own hor- horrifically ironic because my best mate is also a, a ginger bearded guy. So it makes you think, am I doing all this and this is your kid? Because that, oh, no. that would wind me up. But it's not. <laughs> it's definitely mine. <laughs> but um, yeah, we we got back together for the kid. Um, a couple of years down the line, I, I left the military so I could see the kid more. And then um, 2018, I think it was, we we we, we weren't meant to be at all. Mm. Um, she, uh, she's a very attractive woman. She loves the attention of other people. And I was never comfortable with that. I never showed that I was uncomfortable with it. I was just like, I just kept my mouth shut and went along with everything. Um, and then it just got too much. I was just like, not just because of that reason, there was a plethora of reasons, mostly the red flags, but I was just like, I'm, I've got, I can't do this anymore. So we split up in, uh, 2018. Um, at the time, I was living with my mum, I believe, but we were still seeing each other regularly. Um, we got on really well. And then uh, in 2020, for the first lockdown, she asked me to move in with her just because of the bubble, which sounds crazy saying out loud now, but can you remember that being a <laughs> yeah, thing? Yeah, I remember, yeah. Uh, the social bubble, whatever you want to call it. So I moved in with her for the first lockdown just to help out with her and the kids and to see my kid more. Um, and I lived on a mattress this thin in a spare room uh, for however long the first lockdown was. Didn't complain, because I was like, I'm living here for free. Um, I get to see my kid. All I have to do is go shopping occasionally. No dramas. And then after the first lockdown, so this was June 2020, I, I got my own house just around the corner. Uh, she wasn't happy with that. She was like, so is that the end of us then? I was like, we've been over for like two years. Like, we've been... Pl- like platonic we've been pleasant with each other but so even when you moved back in you wasn't like sleeping no I was sleeping in a separate room Um, there was nothing like that we were just completely neutral friends and um, yeah June 2020 I got my own house I actually remember going around her house with the keys like excited to tell her I was like look I've got my own place and she was like what why why have you got your own place is that the end of us then I was like okay why would it not be anyway um, two months later uh, I get a, a message off her. And she says, oh, by the way, I'm moving to Bexhill in Sussex. I was like, why would you do that? How far away is that from where you it's are? It's 148 miles away. Right, it's not around the <laughs> <a> corner. <long laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, um, like, that's some distance, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, I was like, obviously not happy. And I remember to this day, I said it to her in a, in a Costa coffee. I said, that's it, I'm taking you to court. And I genuinely said it as a threat, thinking that, you know, courts are neutral and fair i'm definitely going to win this one because mm. this reasoning for her moving it makes no sense what was her reason uh she was moving for support from her family so right. she, she moved into her mother's attic okay um but she was moving fr- from me and the other two kids father who also lived in swindon mm. um and we we're like why don't the kids stay with us we both got our own houses the kids got their own rooms she's like no i'm moving i need my family support that's it so she moved changed the kids' schools, uh, changed the doctors and everything before I even had the opportunity to put in my court application. Um, six months into those court applications, I then find out that I'm a narcissistic, gaslighting, coercive, controlling, abusive, mega twat, in, for every sense of the word. You think of an accusation, bar murder, I think. I was accused of it. All in the court process. And I was like, where's this all come from? What, how's, what, what's all, all this about? In the six years that I was with her, oh, not six years, how long was it? Yes, yeah, six-ish years. There was one incident where, I think it was like New Year's Eve 19, 2019, 2020, um, where I got drunk and shouted at her and punched a hole in a wall uh, downstairs from a separate floor with her. My friends were there, her friends were there, everyone saw this. Um, I didn't punch the hole because of her, I was just drunk. And... Uh, that wasn't mentioned at all for months. In fact, years later, 
And then when she went to court, she's like, look, he, he domestically abuses me. He punched a hole in my wall. And I'm like, that was nothing to do with you. Um, that, that You weren't even in the same room when that happened. And like all my friends were like, what the hell is she on about? We were there. She used that one example against me to say that I wasn't good enough to be a dad. She tried to take my parental responsibility away. She wanted me out of my son's life. Um, this was on my court application, by the way. I actually came out quite good in, the, in my court application. So I was given an interim order of three weekends a month and two thirds of the school holidays, which granted it meant I had to travel 150 miles each every week, every three weekends out of four to collect him. But she was court ordered to come and collect him from me. Um, that went well for about a year. Uh, and then just before Christmas of 2021, I got a court application from her saying, you're homeless. She sent this to my house, by the way. Uh, you're homeless. You're a drug addict. There was just more stuff added on to all the, the already existing false allegations. Um, and that got told by the courts, no, it's not an urgency thing. Uh, it just needs to go through the normal process, which could take up to two years. Now, four days later, I received a letter from her. I had, uh, she literally wrote a letter, sent it to me, saying that I hit my son. He, he's too scared to see me. And, and uh, just, just highlighting the stuff in the court application. So what she basically done is made up this story to enhance her court application so then it did turn into an emergency hearing. Uh, social services said, right, because of these accusations, you're not allowed to see your son in any capacity until it's been dealt with. Uh, so I didn't see or speak to him for nine months. And in that nine months, they let me write a one-way letter every fortnight, um, which he never responded to. So I was basically talking to a brick wall, but I had to write to it. He was four at the time as well. well he would have been five then, sorry. And it was just torture. I didn't say anything to anybody because at the time I generally thought no one cared. I was like, I'm just a dad, mate. I, I, there's no point in whinging about it. I told my best mate and my mum, because I'm only 33 and I'm a mother's boy, apparently. Well, back then I'm 35 now. And uh, I, yeah, I didn't say anything to anyone. I was still happy-go-lucky, big smile on my face out in public. I didn't tell anyone that I was going through hell behind closed doors. In hindsight, I should have done. Um, but yeah, it was absolute torture. It cost me 25 grand in solicitor fees and I was awarded every other weekend after that after fighting against completely made up allegations against me. Like they, in some of them, they were laughable being homeless, but she sent the paperwork to my house being homeless, but she came to my house to collect him the weekend before I last saw him. Some of it, I was like, I had to actually ask the courts if they'd sent me the right documents. Cause I was like, this isn't me. Like, I don't know who this is. It's not me though, but they're like, no, that's what she's written. Um, yeah. And after all that, nothing was ever done about it. So that's when I thought, actually, you know what? The courts are so drastically against me that there's no point me just, I'm just, just ignore it. I'll just try and keep her happy. Jump through whatever hoop she gives me. Every time she sends me a snotty message, I'll just be like, yes, dear, no dramas. And it just tore me up inside. It's like, I can't live like this. And if anything, what a horrible lesson to teach my son. Like if you ever have kids, you're basically a lap dog for the rest of your life because they can say whatever you want. And I, I know in my case, I'm a dad and she's the mum, but it's not necessarily just that. It does happen the other way around in some cases. But it's like, at the minute, the way the system works is whoever can lie the most and whoever can pay the most. It's not equal at all. It's completely upside down. And only right now have I realised that I'm waffling. I forgot what your question was. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, <I'm> just... <laughs> no, that's fine, mate. We were getting some context just in regard to the relationship. Yeah. Um, but you, you give us a nice sort of timeline there, which, which is absolutely fine. But, to, 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 I mean, I, I gave you a short story long there, but to give you a long story short, right now our relationship, I, we, I, don't, I avoid her as much as possible. Mm. Um, Every time my phone pings and her name comes up, I die a little bit inside. Like, this is never good news. Um, but like I mentioned before, she's a good mum. Like, I've got no... My kid's getting good and we've, we've made a kid that is great. Yeah. And that is mostly her at the minute. But what I'm annoyed at is that I've not got the opportunity to, to contribute either. What do you think her thinking is behind, like not having you involved that's what i always can't get my head around do you know what i mean like i'd i'd want 
my wife to be a part of Jack's life because she's not a bad person, you know, and I can understand if, if people are abusive or whatever, but it seems to me, you know, I don't know you, but you seem yeah. like a really nice guy. You seem really genuine, you know, as long as you're not abusing your, your son and, and or your ex partner and stuff like that, I just, I never understand the mindset because I've had friends that who are really nice guys that are not allowed to see their children have to fight through family court and I just never can understand the the thinking behind it. That's what I really struggle with. It's just the the like you said, she was she's a good mum. She's probably, you know, when you was together, you had good times together, you know, nothing major happened in the relationship breakup. I just never really understand that part of it where you can kind of hate someone enough to hurt them that much to then not be able to see your son. That's just, I just cannot get my head around that, no matter how many times I go over and speak to so many people about it. And, you know, if you don't have the money, I've had friends that don't have the financial power. You spent, say, you spent 25,000. I've got friends that have got no, no money. So they, they've basically given up the right to see their child. Because they can't afford it. Because they can't afford to do it. Yeah. And that there is just, in itself, just crazy. It's, 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 it is insane. It, the, 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 the way the, the structure works, just it's not, it's not suitable for anybody. Hmm. There's no winners in the Did family. Did it cost her a lot? This is the, this is no, the other thing. it cost her, what, I think, £210 in total, because that's <laughs> how much an application costs. So what does it cost you and not her? Because I got legal representation. Right. Uh, this, I have to admit, the first, so the court application I put in cost me 210 quid. I represented myself. Um, but the, and I came out quite good. I got three weekends out of four. But then when she took me to court, because of the allegations, I was like, but that's way above me. I better get some professional help. So I got a solicitor and a barrister, both of which I wish I never got because I ended up losing a weekend, cost losing 25 grand. And once I got to each stage of the process, they gave me the opposite information that I was giving them. So I, was like, I wanted 50-50. You've just agreed to every other weekend, which is on a court order, which he's now given everyone saying, look, he only wanted every other weekend. No, I didn't. I wanted 50-50. That's what my barrister said, but I had to keep my mouth shut because she was talking. But anyway, um, the first question you asked about why, why is she doing this? Yeah. So at the very early stages, I wanted prime carer so when i took her to court i wanted him to live with me now i understand why she retaliated the way she did because i'd have probably done the same thing knowing what i know now i didn't at the time but she's like well this guy's trying to take my kids off me i will do and say whatever it takes to stop that from happening now that that stopped if she stopped started telling the truth now saying actually he's never abused me he's, he's never hurt the kids he's never done this that goes against what she said earlier so she, she can't start backing off from the story she has to commit to that lie uh, which is one of the reasons I'm trying to change it it's like if those lies were never there or there was a deterrence from it stuff like this wouldn't happen um, uh, I, I don't know if you if, if you follow it, any of the stuff I've posted but there's um, there was one what I like to call a flying monkey yeah so one of her friends that heard her story was attacking me online. And I was reading all this stuff. I'm like, I paid £25,000 to prove all this stuff is false. And she's still committing to these lies. But I get why she's doing it. Like I said, she can't back off now because then that goes against everything she said to all her friends and family. Um, so that's why I think mm. it's it's the way it is. It's like, she, even if she rung me up right now and said, you know what, this is ridiculous. You're walking around the country with a chihuahua. You look crazy. Come home. Have your kid 50-50. I'd still keep going because she could change her mind at the drop of a hat yeah. because of these court orders, um, which is why I'm doing it overall. But yeah, that's why I think it, the, the relationship's got so sour. She saw me as someone trying to take her kids, so she retaliated by just saying whatever she had to to, to counteract that. Yeah, and, and why were you trying to do that in the beginning? Why were you trying to get to a primary custody and not 50-50? So when, I, well, I asked for primary custody until she got herself on her feet. By that, I mean, when she moved to Sussex originally, she was moving into her mum's attic. Her mum lives in a flat. She, she moved into the attic with three kids, a dog. I was like, that's not really good. And at the time, it was COVID. I was like, you're just moving the kids around. They've got to change schools. They're, they're living in a loft. Just give me, uh, Travis, until you get on your... I even offered her my house. I was like, you can come back and have the house. I'll move out somewhere else. And you can have my house until you get back on your feet. Uh, but no, I, all of that was completely disregarded um she then met someone well i say she met someone it turns out later on that they met before that's why she moved it was because she met this bloke who 
rather annoyingly, he's like the perfect guy ever. He's like, I've got no dramas with him at all. Um, but if she just said that at the start, he would probably evaded all of this crap. But she didn't. And, um, but yeah, I wanted him to live with me because I was under an honest impression that she was moving to Sussex to live in her mum's attic. So that's why I took her to court. I was like, you're crazy. That's, that's you give him back until you get at least a house. So that's why I wanted primary care. Uh, when we, when she took me to court, um, that she was after me being removed entirely. She wanted me to be have my parental responsibility removed so that I couldn't have anything to do with him. Um, why she did that, I'm not entirely sure. I think she was aiming high to the so whatever she got awarded was sort of a win. But uh, I ended up getting with the generic bog standard every other weekend, seven weeks of the school holidays. Uh, which is not ideal. Yeah, and what's the um, what's the, the kind of financial implication with this situation for you as well? Because I um, I spoke to a friend recently, went through a divorce, and had two children, and I think he's you know on, on good terms with with the ex and their co-parenting, and everything's fine. So a much different situation, but there was obviously a period where they were going through CSA and, and getting all that figured out. And one thing that he said to me, which he was really surprised at, is they, is they means tested him. Mm -hmm. How much do you earn? This is how much you have to pay based on how much you earn, but then even look at how much he earn. Yeah. And that surprised me. So, I mean, <laughs> thank the Lord I never married her because I would definitely be over that cliff by now if I had done. I've got a pretty warped sense of humor. Feel free to laugh. No, that's all good. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, we never married, but when it comes to the financial stuff, again, like I mentioned before, okay. I had to pay 25 grand for solicitor fees and barrister fees, which not many people talk about. I had to pay for my solicitor to rep not represent, but assist her because the courts ordered my solicitor to do that. I was like, hang on a minute. What, how does that work? So they, because she was self representing, she couldn't con uh, construct a pack, like an information pack with all her evidence. So she instructed the, the judges, sorry, instructed my solicitor that I was paying for to construct her in her evidence pack against me, and I had to pay them. <laughs> I'm like, how? What's going on here? That is fucking ridiculous. My solicitor is like, I'm sorry, the courts have ordered it. I've got you. And this is out of your pocket. And that's well, out of right? my pocket. Um, Pff, it's mate, it's, this it's is an absolute, fucking mind blowing. <laughs> it's sorry, absolutely sorry. joke. It's a joke. I'll, go, I'll, I'll give you another example on the, the, the finance thing. I would message my solicitor. Or I'd email her. That's 25 quid. She would read it, 25 quid. She'd then forward it to my ex, 25 quid. My ex would respond, 25 quid. My solicitor would then forward that response to me, 25 quid. So for me to ask, I don't know, ask the mother, what time do you want me to pick him up? That would cost me 100 quid. I, whoa, 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 what's going on? And, and, and the, my solicitor would be like, whenever you've got a problem, Whenever you, I remember ringing her up, crying my eyes out once because I was like, "How is she getting away with this?" And she charged me for that phone call. It cost me near on three hundred quid. She's like, "I'm really sorry. I better go because I've got another customer." But you are aware this cost two hundred quid. I was like, "What?" <laughs> Honest to God, it's just money, money, money. And no matter what angle you go for, and then I'll give you the, the current situation on it. So I stopped paying CMS to my to my kid's mum, which you're probably thinking oh, that's not really good. Now, when I moved to Sussex, I was like, I'm here willing, able, and eager to be a dad. I'm, I live across the road. I'm, I work flexibly. I work remotely. I can drop everything at the drop of a hat if he needs me. Um, let me be more involved. Now, I said to her at the start, uh, we'll, I'll, we'll trickle into it. I don't want him to go from your you 75% to me to me 50% because that's just going to confuse him. We'll trickle in an extra day a week, maybe every other Wednesday. And at first she was like, yeah, that's, that can work. So she let me have him overnight on a Monday, a uh, Sunday night, once, I might add. Um, and then I got a notification from CMS. She was asking for more money. I'm like, hang on a minute, I'm seeing the kid more. So I messaged her, I was like, what's this all about? You, if I see the kid more, you're clearly going to get less money. That's, that's how it works. Boom, immediate barriers are up. Right, we're going straight to the court order then. You only get him every other weekend. Even though I drive past his school and his house daily. I was like, I can, I can get more involved here. She's like, if you, want, if you want more access, you've got to go to court. I was like, hang on a minute. You want me to pay you to actively not let me see my child now? Because I didn't mind doing it when I was in Wiltshire. I couldn't contribute emotionally, 
uh, physically, mentally. But now I can. You, you're only interested in the finance. <coughs> Sorry. That's not me choking up. I've just got something in my throat. <laughs> um, and that's when it hit me. It's, it's, all, it's all money. There's no incentive for a primary parent to let the, let's call it secondary parent, to see their kid more. Because if I see my son more, she gets paid less CMS. So of course she's not going to let me do that. That's a, a financially stupid decision on her part. Um, I mean, it's also morally wrong, but yeah. Um, why would she let me see more if she gets less money? And that's how the system works at the minute. It's so out of date, isn't it? Because I can understand how that would have worked 50 years ago yeah. when women didn't work. Well, this is this is the issue, right? The, yeah. the, the family courts genuinely think that all the blokes are in the coal mine still and all the <laughs> mums are at home in pennies baking cookies. It's like the, the current, the Children's Act that we're working off predominantly is from 1989. It hasn't been updated since Thatcher was in power. Mm. Um, <laughs> Charles, when I was born. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. I mean, I'm an 88 born. baby, but yeah. uh, it's ridiculous. Like, I can't believe that... To be honest, I, it pisses me off the more I think about it. It's taken... Because no one would give a shit what I'm saying unless I was walking around the country with a chihuahua. <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm completely comfortable with that. I know this is stupid. I, would, I don't want to be doing it. I'd rather be at home in my pants watching Netflix. <laughs> but it takes so much stupid like this for people to go, actually, he's got a point. Yeah. Um, it is so outdated. Sorry, he just burped. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, sorry, you were going to say something else. Yeah, no, it was just that. It's just, um, yeah, it's just, it's mad because I think where we are now with equality, you know, within the workplace and across pretty much every other aspect of of Western life, we're still working off this fucking ancient system. Yeah. It's equality where it benefits people, mate. Yeah. Yeah, It's chosen equality. You know what I mean? It's chosen equality. Yeah. That's the truth. It is true. I mean, I've posted a lot of stuff online since I've been doing this. Yeah. And um, I have had a few people, I say a few, a very select handful of, I don't want to say bitter mummers, but it's bitter mummers that have got a genuine deadbeat dad. So that's, it's someone that's like, oh, I've got three kids with, oh, I don't know, Trevor. And he sees them once a year, pays me no maintenance. Now, that's not what I'm fighting for then. That's a genuine deadbeat dad. And there's lots of them. And there's yeah. no two ways about it. There's but lots there's of them. genuine deadbeat mums too. Yeah. And, I, and if we concentrated our current structure on those assholes that are ruining it for everybody else, of course it's not going to work. And that's what we're doing. I think it's every walk of life you have shit people. Yeah. You have yeah. people that are just not nice people, men and women. It's It's... It's everywhere, yeah, you know. You, yeah. We all know someone who's a bit of a shit mum or a bit of a shit dad, yeah. you know. And there's so many people who experience that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I know, I know mums that are very self sufficient, you know, sort of a, a single mums and a, nothing come to sustain their 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 lives and look after their children. And they're fucking desperate for their dads to see their kids. Yeah, yeah. And they're just not interested. And it's it's heartbreaking when you speak to people like you. Where you know, sadly, you've ended up on the at the other end of the spectrum. We were desperate to see your child, and your ex is is just making it fucking impossible. And what's her reaction been to you actually doing this? Have you spoke to her, or like she must think, what the fuck? I I messaged, so I I didn't give her any warning that I was doing this, and there was a reason for that. I knew if I said, by the way, I'm going around the country to highlight the inequalities of the family court. She'd be straight on the defence. She's like, right, you're not seeing your son. So I told her last minute on the last weekend I planned to have him. I explained what I was doing to him to a degree. And I messaged her and said, just to let you know, I'm going away to walk the coast. I'll probably be gone between a year and two years. Take a wild guess the one question she questioned. And I said I was going away for a year. How are you going to earn money? Yes, that is exactly how you it. Pay what are you going to do about your job? But I think some people watching will be asking the same thing. So it's good that we come on to this to clear yeah. it up for you, mate. So I... I I, I, I do, I'll be honest, when she messaged me that, I just ignored the question because I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm, I'm leaving our son with you for two, up to two years and the only thing you're worried about is the financial aspect of it, not like, how's Travis going to take this? Um, so with the money thing, I, I saved up some money for it. Um, I saved up some money for me and I saved up some money for my son. So he's got some money that I can control. I've made it very clear to his mum, I'm not paying CMS whilst I'm gone because I don't have a job. However, I didn't want my son losing out on anything. So if he does need anything, I still talk to him. He, he still, I still message him now. I messaged him yesterday. He, he texted me back a, a relatively funny YouTube video. Um, 
But I said, if you need money, text me and I can send you some. I, gave, I left him like a Revolut card. And um, But when it comes to funding it, I've got a GoFundMe page. There is options to send cash if anyone wants to. But I've actually said I'd rather the message get shared. If you want to donate, I'm not going to stop you. But I'd prefer the message to be out there as put towards the funding. I'm a big guy. I can, if I run out of money, I'll just eat shellfish or something. I'm not asked. But um, it's the dog I'm worried about because he doesn't like fish. <laughs> he don't look like he needs a lot of food, mate, no, to be honest. No, <laughs> he's, he's the only dog I know of that's got fatter since he started walking around. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm carrying him for most of it. But yeah, to answer the question, uh, I've set, I saved some money enough, enough money that I can get food because um, water, there's streams and stuff everywhere. So I've got some filters. I've got some stuff to boil up the water. Yeah. I can go full raw dog if needs be if that makes sense mm -hmm. but um but yeah that's that's how i've got around that yeah okay so there is uh there is a pot of money available to your son yeah. if you need stuff yeah yeah let's let's talk about travis mate because we've obviously talked about you know your perspective her perspective but obviously the important person really is is this poor kid stuck in the middle right mm -hmm. so what age was he when you guys separated uh he would have been two when we split up but he would have been four before he realized that we weren't a couple okay so he was four during the lockdown when yeah. you guys were like platonically living together okay so i mean my 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 son's four now so i know exactly what four years are like he asks why at the end of everything my my parents came over earlier and i said uh nanny i think i said oh, mum's coming up uh, nanny and grandpa are coming over and he was you just said mum why'd you say mum well, Nanny's my mum. Why? Do you mean why? She just she's my mum. Like, you're my <laughs> why? I don't know how to explain this, son. But she just she's my mum. She's your grandma. That's what you need to worry about. <laughs> so they're super inquisitive. So how was that? Like being in the house, but kind of apart. You know, was he asking questions? And then obviously during that period where you you then moved out the house and then she left. Like what was the what was like the, the the kind of communication with Travis like at that point? Can you remember? Yes, uh, it was non-existent. He would never ever talk to me. He still doesn't. He never, he never talks to me about his mum ever. Um, even if she's brought up in a conversation, he'll change the subject. He's fully aware that we don't get on. You know, not because he's been said anything by me. Um, like when I pick him up from school, I was like, "How was your weekend?" He's like, "Oh yeah, we went to wherever." I was like, "Where'd you go?" It was me and the family. He never says his mum. He, he doesn't talk to me about it, um, which is sad because he's eight and he knows his parents hate each other. But it's the only way around it, really. But what, what I mean by that is come Sundays when he's with me, he'll be like, oh, can I stay an extra night? And I'm like, I'm sorry, mate, you can't. And he'll always ask me why. Now, I can't say because your mum, so I don't say it. I just say, look, mate, I'm really sorry. If you could, I would, but I've got things on. So I've got to put that blame on me each time. Yes, <laughs> that, isn't it? Because uh, if I put the blame on her, it just, it's like, well, why are you saying all this stuff about me to our son? So I just, like, I'll take it. And I've been doing that for years. Like, it's, I, I can't belittle his mum because if I do, it's a horrible thing for him to learn. Yeah. And, and if she gets wind of it, I get grief as well. And it's just like, it's not worth it. I'd rather just take the grief off him. I'd rather him think I don't want him to be here than uh, no, scrap that because that sounds terrible. That's going to choke me up because obviously I do. I'd rather him think that I've got something else on or I'm going away somewhere. It's just why you can't stay with me as opposed to you can't stay with me because your mum won't let you because that's just horrible. But um, there's no other way around it, really. It's... Uh, it's a horrible setup. Yeah, and, and you said there was a nine-month period where you didn't see him. How old was he at that point? The, he would so pretty much the entire time <clears throat> he was five. Okay, I didn't see him. And when you did see him, I mean, what was that like after nine months? He didn't notice at all. As soon as he saw me, he's like, "You're right, Dad." Okay. I was like, "Are you kidding me? I've gone through hell <laughs> to come see you." And it, it was he was like, "How long has it been?" I was like, nine months. I haven't seen you for nine months." He's like, ah, "I've got a new toy." <laughs> um, but it, that, to be honest with you, I th when that first happened, I thought he's oh, he's going to break down because he's not seen me for so long, and he was just like, "You're right, mate." Um, and I was like, "I can't believe I've gone through all this, and you just don't give a shit." But he was he was only he was just about to turn six, so it's not like I couldn't like they're pretty resilient at that age. Yeah, mate, they, they are. are. He's, yeah. he's got no time perception now. Yeah, um, but 
Okay, that's that's good. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. I always I, I work away a little bit, not for particularly long periods, but even just like three or four days. And I always have these fantasies that will come home and he'll come running towards me, yeah. give me a big hug, and normally he'll go, have you got me anything? Punch. Because <laughs> yeah. when I first saw him, the, so after the court, the nine months, I had to see him in... They called it a um, a reintroduction program. So I'd see him for four hours one week, and then two weeks later I'd see him for four hours, and then two weeks later I'd see him for six hours. And then it did that until it was eight hours, until it was overnight. I never once had any supervised access. So even after the nine months of being accused of being a mega twat, I, I, even after all that, I never had supervised access. It was like, yeah, he's perfectly safe, off you go. It was more... So Travis was comfortable seeing me again, which he was immediately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, f- four hours in a fortnight. And I was like, Are you kidding? it takes me longer to drive there than I've seen him for. Um, and yeah, yeah, that wasn't ideal. Yeah. But like I said, he's, he was five. He, and again, he saw me at a pier where we went in an arcade. He had loads of fun. Of course, he's going to go back. And we had loads of fun. Yeah, yeah. Which in turn made her hate me more. Yeah. He was like, I'm the fun dad again. I was like, you made me the fun dad. I don't want to be like this. Mm. But, and what's he make of this? This How was the, did you have a conversation with him about the fact that you're going to be away for a period of time now and what you're doing? I did. So we were sat on the, the sofa in my house. And obviously I, I knew it was happening, but it was going to be the last weekend I'd see him. So, because if I told him any earlier, you'd have told his mum, and she would have stopped me from seeing him. So I said to him, "I'm going away for a year, possibly two. And he was, he, he, he so he started crying, but like the bottom lip, like he was trying not to show that he was crying. I was like, "It's all right, mate. You can cry if you want." And uh, and he was like, "Why?" I was like, "Because I've got to do. I've got. To, I'm doing this for you, mate. Like." It's, it's, it, trust me, you'll understand one day. And he was like, but why tell me now? So I said, right, okay. Now my son's obsessed with Roblox. He's always on the iPad. Roblox. Ro- Roblox. Roblox. I know what Roblox does. Yeah. You'll find out in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, all right, imagine if me and you had an iPad. I get to play with the iPad for two weeks. You get to play with it for two days. But for the two days that you're playing with the iPad, you have to pay me. How do you feel? He was like, oh, that's not fair. I was like, exactly. So what would you think I should do? And he was like, get another iPad. I was like, no, son. You know, <laughs> there's no iPad here. Like this. this is a bigger picture, but just don't look, stick with me on this. So I got. he was like, okay, so what you're going to do is make it even that we can both play iPad. I was like, there you go. That's what I'm trying to do. So essentially, my kid thinks I'm walking around the country so he can play on an iPad more. But I thought it was a bit too much to say, you fucking mum, it won't let me see you more than I want to um, without pain countless thousands again I'm dragging losing out on time to spend with him which oh, how many how many days a week was you seeing him just just then th- th- that was t- t- for two I, I had him over a weekend right okay so you have so, so I had him every other weekend I'd pick him up from school on a Friday and then her boyfriend would come collect him on a Sunday because she was in Wiltshire so you see him for four days a month four days a month and I lived five minutes away from him so my my question obviously is like in my head, it's like you're going away and you're leaving him again, which is must be tough. But if you're seeing him for four days out of the month, I kind of understand it a lot more that the bigger picture is you should raise more awareness and hopefully be able yeah. to see him more. So I, I, I have said to him, like, if you want me back, like there's something you want me back for, I will be back within a few hours. I can get a train back, do whatever it is he needs, and I'll go back and carry on. Birthdays, Christmas, things like that. Mm-hmm. I've also got my family that have supported me. I've said, look, like my brother, for example, is trying, I'm not crossing my fingers or anything, to collect him so that he can come visit well, me. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Would he, would he, for a weekend, come camping and, and make a kind of a yeah, weekend? Yeah, and he'd it, love you know? it. I used to take him camping all the time. In fact, me taking him camping in is why his mother accused me of being homeless. Um, but, yeah, he, he would absolutely love it. And I, every day I'll do, do or see something, I think, Travis would love this. Um even when my t- tent was getting attacked by a fox the other night, it's like, Travis loves foxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I understand that it's, it's a bit weird because like, well, you you have access and you've left him to do this. I just think people listening would be thinking that. A yeah. Bit, yeah. You know? and, in, and I was going to ask, actually, like, do you ever think about, do you ever miss him enough to just sack it in and go back? But then actually, I'm, I'm my head's thinking about the fact that I see my son every day because mm. we live together. Um, 
But actually, if I was only seeing him every other week, four times a month. Four times a month is nothing, is no. it? When you really think about that, that's, that's not that's even such a whole shit days. Month. That's I pick him up after school on a Friday, and he gets he got picked up um, at five five yeah. yeah five o'clock on a Sunday. So really, like when it's all said and done, if you did this for a year, you know you, you've you've only kind of really missed like a month's worth of me seeing my son. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's not as much as like, it know, feels like, is it? If, it? if once my son reaches eighteen, if you take those four days a month and add it all up, it means I'd have missed thirteen years of his life. Yeah, that's shit, mate. All right, that's that's not a parent. That's a fun. That's the funkel that you see fortnightly. His he sees his nan more than he sees me. He stays with his nan every Wednesday. And I asked his mum, he's like, why don't you just stay with me on that day? No, he needs to meet his, he needs to spend time with his his, his nan as well. I was like, my mum hasn't seen him in six months. Like, that, to that, to that four days a month, by the way, includes my extended family as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just not fair at all. Well, I find it extraordinary as well. You've even moved cities to see him. Yeah. Which is just, you know, that people can't question your desire to see your son you know you've changed jobs you've moved cities you've done paid it so much money you know you're doing this and it's like how easy would it been for you to just give up and just be like not not i'm not, not saying like kill yourself i mean just give up on your son and be like okay i accept it i'm not going to see my son and i'm just going to move on and there must be thousands and tens of thousands of dads in that position whenever i hear the term deadbeat Again, that's one of the reasons I use. I, I try to make it a banner of yeah. strength as opposed to, you know, because in fact, the last conversation I had with my kid's mother was, oh, "You called yourself a deadbeat. That's the most truthful thing you've said all year." And I was like, "That was a cool dig. I'll give you that. Fair one." But um, the amount of dads I've met that have they've given up on their kids, not because they've given up on their kids, they've given up on the system. Yeah. It's like I can't it's a situation, isn't it? It's not not just the financial, but the mental strain on it. It's like it is unbearable. It's to the point where it's like. If I do any more, I'm just going to snap. So I'll just step back and the kids can f figure out when they're older, which is a, an unspoken side of this, this as well. The amount of people who've spoken to me about not necessarily themselves going through the family courts, but being a child of parents that went through the family courts. Interesting. And that it's just, it's just messed their heads up. It's like, I don't trust either one of my parents now because they both told me each one of the other parent was the biggest asshole since the last asshole. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I've never had the perspective of yeah, of someone who's I think it'll be the, the next generation of people if that makes sense. I think they'll be, you know, like our kids, you know what I mean? Their generation or experience would have experienced that a lot more because our generation really probably didn't have that as much. So I, 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 mean? I, I I was in a family with a mum and dad that was together until I was 19 and my dad passed away. Like I have I had a good upbringing. Um my kid's mother, their her parents have hated each other since she was a little girl, and it, they still hate each other now. Like I went interested, to the, interest in that. Huh? Take from that what you will. I'm just saying. Like, um, but it just seems to be like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. If that makes sense, and um, it's and it's so common. Like even this day and age, how many people do you not? I'm, no offense here, it's used to, but how many people do you honestly know that are still together with their, their parent's kid? It's more common now to be a single parent than it is to be. Yeah, I've been, I've been with my wife uh, to coming up 20 years, and that everyone's just like fucking gobsmacked. Yeah. I've been with her since school, and people are just like, what the fuck? You're still, you're still with her, you know? And there's obviously, there's bumps along the road and stuff like that, but I'm really, really passionate about being a family and being there for Jack and being there for Kirsty, you know, and, and, it's not perfect, but how many people just fucking call it quits really quick or get pregnant or do this or do that? And, you know, it's it's definitely those sort of values sometimes that, like you said, if your your ex is from a broken kind of home and she doesn't respect some of those values and she thinks those values are normal, she's not going to, she's, when, with her relationships, if she's gone through, she's got a previous partner, she's got you, now she's with another partner, if she has more children, like, I'm not judging her on that. I'm just saying those the the upbringing of the person is what affects people later on in life yeah absolutely which going off that sort of pattern that means my son's going to be part of that sort of statistic which mm -hmm. is what i'm trying to stop i don't want him to grow up thinking like i'm just a dad
Yeah, I, w- I wish I looked at some st- statistics on um, children who have their parents together versus parents split up. In, yeah. And I know there's some some wild statistics around how they develop in life and uh, how much money they earn and how they develop with, with all sorts of yeah. different ways. And well, that think, fascinates me a little bit. Yeah, I think if... Um you know, if, if, if people want to go and check that out, I think obviously the Tin Men's blog, yeah. blog on, on Instagram um, or watch our previous episode with him because he talked a little bit about that. But essentially boys that grow up in single mother households are pretty much like statistically worse and sort of disadvantaged in every aspect. Mm. You know what I mean? They, they do worse at school. They do worse, you know, in, in, in adult life. They're more likely to go to jail. It's just madness. It's madness. And I think uh, it's quite hard to find this data in the UK, I think, but certainly in America, which is... Yeah, they publish a lot more data, don't they? The American data is substantially better than the UK. But that's one of the main problems as well, because most of the family court um, cases are kept... You put on what is essentially a gag order. I think it's a section nine or a section 21, which basically means you're not allowed to discuss what happens in the family courts outside of the family courts. I'm essentially breaking that right now. But... If someone doesn't start talking about it, it's just going to get worse because it is it's it's so bad. But but it it does feel like you know people um, these days don't obviously value the family unit like we were just talking about. Um, but again, pulling on that American data, um, it seems like women are leaving men a lot more than men are leaving women, and you have to wonder if that's because they know they've got all the fucking cards. Oh, they have absolutely, mate. There's there's no doubt about that even. Even with mine and Kirsty's situation, you know what I mean. There's if if we split up tomorrow, she would have the house. Of course she would, because she's got my son, and my son would stay with her. I'm pretty sure I'll probably end up living back at my mum's for a while, getting myself back on my feet, you know X Y Z. But as a as a woman, you always have that option of if you if you're in a fairly good financial position with your partner, and for whatever reason your head gets turned, or he's being a bit of a deadbeat, or he's just you know pissing you off, really. They're in such a strong situation where 100%. they got. They're not going to be. They're not going to be affected financially. They're not going to be affected. You know, really in any way. Most women can always get another man. You know, it's not like as if you know. It, it's a lot different. There's a lot more lonely men than there are lonely women. There's no doubt about that. You know, if you get to a certain age, if you're in your forties or fifties and you've not looked after yourself as a man, it's fucking hard to find a new partner. Whereas a woman, she can be pretty bang average overweight not look after herself great but at 40 50 even she could still find a bloke there's Crying. no two fucking ways about yeah, it yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> and they are in that situation where they 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 do have that freedom to choose what they want to do and if it, everything's not aligning right they think you know what actually i can fuck him off i can have a little bit more money he's going to have to pay me xyz csa we've got oh, i'll keep the house you know i'll keep this i'll keep that the debt he can take this he can take <laughs> and you can start again but you have to wonder if the courts were fairer and completely neutral and, you know, sort of people, women, you know, probably for the most part, but some guys as well, were in a position where they thought, right, if we split up, then it's going to be 50-50. I'm not going to be sort of financially benefited. I'm not going to have all the control. Actually, maybe we should just try a little bit harder and make this work and, and stick it out and not, you know, jump on his best mate or, yeah. you know, like do whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's, it's fucked. It really is. And you speak to most people as well. The grass is rarely greener on the other side. Yeah. You get what I mean? It's like a cycle, isn't it? It's yeah. like it goes from oh, one no, no, relationship to The grass is much greener on the on our side now. <laughs> I'm a new fella. I'm, I'm actually quite jealous. Of it's like a Ryan Reynolds hot. <laughs> if I was, I would basically, but I'm not. So <laughs> he's gonna watch this like yeah. fucking hell. <laughs> but mate, but it's it's nice that you're able to say that though, um, because you know, again, it just shows a little bit about your character, mate, and your situation that you're not bitter and angry, and you know, you you're ultimately just trying to see your kids. Um, and it sounds like, in all fairness, you've been quite complimentary of your other half or your ex, sorry, in regard to her mothering skill. Um, you know, her new unit, it, 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 for me, mate, it's just, it's been, it's quite clear in this conversation that it's just about seeing your kid. Mm. If she rang you up now and said you can have half of the time, would you stop and no. go back? No, I wouldn't. And the reason I wouldn't is because she could also ring me again in a week and stop it at the drop of a hat. The cards are all in her hand. Yeah. And that's what I'm, and I said this from the beginning, like, I'm not doing this because of her. The problem I'm doing this for is bigger, bigger than her. Yeah. Um, 
I've got nothing. There's there's nothing she can say to me right now that's going to get me to change my mind. Yeah. Um, because it's it's so much bigger than the issues I've got with her. I don't have issues with her. I've got issues with the the options that she's been given that I haven't. Mm. That's my issue. Yeah, that makes sense. So obviously, you know, we, we're doing this to try and make change, right? And raise awareness. So, you know, people may already be aware of a group of men dressing up in a Batman outfit in, in various superhero outfits and climbing, I think, was it Parliament or Buckingham Palace? Something like that. So, Batman, yeah. Yeah, so Fathers for Justice have obviously been at this at least for 10 years, maybe 15 or longer. Um, there was a guy locally that, that was involved quite heavily um, back in probably, I was 25 when I knew the guy. I'm 41 now, so 15 years ago. You look great, by the way. Thank you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, exercise and no alcohol these days. Jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu people do it. Um, but yeah, they've obviously been at it for a while and we don't see we've really, it doesn't feel like we've changed at all. Mm. Like you said, we're still working off of like an 89 law here. So, I mean... You're obviously doing this because you, you, I guess, have faith and belief in your heart that something will change. But what does your brain tell you? Does it? Do you think it's really going to make a difference? Um, I do. Um, I do think. If I mean, there's there's so many things against the change, and I understand that. But there's, it's got to the point now. I, 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 the first week or two, I was like, "What am I doing? Like, I'm just making a tit of myself here." But then, since I've spoken to people, and I've spoke to. I've heard other people's stories, which in some cases are even worse than mine. In fact, most cases, because at least I still have the option to see my yeah. kid at the minute. But I, it's the, the, the positive feedback about it has been so overwhelming. It's like, there's this many people that are against it. How can it not change? Now, I understand Fathers for Justice, who you were referencing earlier. They, and yeah, there was a couple of weirdos that dress up as Batman and try to do something in the early 2000s. But what is that achieving? Yeah, they're all over the press and everyone recognises them. But what did they do for that change? What I'm doing is, although I'm walking around the country, I've got a petition. It's like, right, look, this is a petition. We need to equalise this. Everyone knows it's not fair. Sign this. Help me. But with Fathers for Justice, and this is my personal opinion, and this, isn't, I, this is just what I believe about them, although they are doing good work, they're not trying to change the process. They're trying to help people through it, um, which is what I've got a problem with. Like, yeah, that's great. Fathers of Justice are doing a great job helping fathers go through the court system. But my problem is the court system. It's like, I don't want to be contributing it anymore because it's not fit for purpose. Um, so although, yeah, people, most people ask me, are you doing this Fathers for Justice? And when I first started off, when I made the GoFundMe, I did say the funds were for Fathers for Justice. But then I have to do my own research. I was like, no, because in some sort of way, they're just contributing towards the issue that I have, um, which that's my, again, that's my personal opinion of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I can understand why they didn't make an impact because dressing up as Batman is not going to do anything. I could dress up as Batman and do this. It's not going to make any difference. <laughs> um, but going out there, speaking to people, but I think that's what's missing in, in a lot of of issues in the country is that people just whinge on the internet this is shit yeah we all know it's shit but what's just sitting around whinging about it going to do I'm actually going out and looking people in the eye and saying look how shit this is help me um, which so far has been working quite well great and the petition that you've got so what is it, what's the petition for exactly so there's two main key points I want I'm putting on the petition first and foremost I think let's say me and you went into court I'd be a very lucky man if I did because we've got a child together. One of us is going to be assumed the primary carer and one of us is going to be assumed the, the fighting parent for access. What I think it should be is that once we go step foot in court, we're seen as equal parents, not mother, well, in our case, father and father, but in any other case, mother and father, it would be parent and parent. There's no, it doesn't, we don't want to know the backstory. You are equal parents that have made this child together and the evidence that you should be providing should be explaining why that can't be the case, not why it should be the case. That way, it's you've, you've got a fair chance. It's, you're not seen as a father, you're seen as an equal parent. I just think that's a yeah. lot fairer. Now, the only way that can work is if we change the current family court's approach to false allegations. Now, at the minute, you can go into a family court and say whatever you want. The, the more wild, the better. And once it's proven to be wrong... There's no back. There's no backlash from that. There's no, you know, you're not held accountable for lying in court, which is insane to me. So what I think is that if you go into the courts and 
make accusations that are clearly false, proven false by social services or CAFCAS, you should be then made accountable and have to pay the costs associated with that investigation to deter, deter people from just talking out of their asses in the courtroom. If we do that, the amount of court applications would probably half because people wouldn't just go there talking shit just trying to piss off the other parent. All the associated services, social services, CAFCAS, the police, everybody, their workload would be half because not only everyone's going there talking shite anymore. It's just, it makes logical sense to me. Um, 50-50 is a starting point and false allegations come with accountability. Yeah. Purgatory. Is it purgatory or purgatory? It's purgatory. Purgatory. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think the first point is excellent, mate. And, and yeah, completely back that. And I think the second point is as well. Um, but I know that the, 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 the kind of argument with that, and I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, this is just me being balanced. But obviously there's a danger if you uh, penalise people um, for potentially being found not to be telling the truth, then does that, in the genuine cases... Does that deter people, women and men, from making these allegations that are legitimate through fear of then it being found not legitimate and having to pay? So that's a good point. Um, I'll give you an example, and this is a personal one to me. I got accused of hitting my son, uh, which is what was the, the, the anchor to her court application to get an immediate hearing. Now, when she accused me of hitting my son, it was on a date that I wasn't with him. Uh, she sent a picture of a bruise to, the, to the, the courts that he received whilst she was with him. It was dated while she was with him. He actually got this bruise from being at school, which was on this school report. As soon as she made the, the report, she had to go and see the GP who wrote a statement saying not only did he, this, this child not say he hit him, but there's no bruises, there's no nothing. When I went into the police station for my interview, they, they showed me a picture of my son with a black eye. Uh, I was like, they were like, can you explain this? I was like, yeah, he got that from the school. When he fell over, here's the school report on it, which was signed by the other parents. Oh, so they've done like an injury report form? Yeah, they did an injury report form. He had a black eye the day after he left mine. Well, sorry, the day before he arrived to mine. Um, and they said, well, the, the, apparently you, you caused this. So I showed them the letter that the GP wrote saying because they, they had to do a report. I mean, the same day that she put the report in the police, she was told, you have to go see the GP. The GP wrote, not only did he not hit him, but there's no marks on his body. He's got a slight ear infection, but we can give him some antibiotics for that. There's nothing. That letter from the GP miraculously didn't go to the police station, but she didn't know that I'd got a copy of it as well. So I gave it to the police. They were like, yeah, this is ridiculous. This clearly didn't happen. This is completely made up. Like I wasn't even in the same county as him when he got that injury. Completely false allegation. And she'd actually supplied evidence that was nothing to do with what she... Uh, so it was completely false. Once that was found out that she was lying, there was no backlash from that. That's it fucking was, wild though, isn't it? Like that is just wild. Like one to even do that, but just the second one, just that is no repercussion of just... Yeah blatant lie. It's like she said in the report that my, my son's reported that I hit him on the head, but he had a black eye. I'm like, well, that's not even the same place that she said I hit him. When he was asked, because obviously he got put in a room very similar to this, cameras in his face, bright lights. Where did your dad hit you? I don't know. Why did he hit you? I don't know. When did he hit you? I don't know. What did he hit you for? I don't know. This kid has no recollection of this happening. It's just his mother that seems to think it happened. And there was absolutely no backlash on that. It was just like, okay, everyone's happy. We'll just move on. I'm like, no, I didn't see my kid for nine months because of this. And it's clear black and white that she lied about it. And there is absolutely no backlash. Yeah. What's stopping her from doing it again? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I think it sounds like what you're saying, where there's clear evidence that someone has lied, yeah. there should be repercussions. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I mean, I understand what you're saying. If you go in there and say, oh, I don't know, he... He kicked me, yeah. and there's no. Well, when did he kick you? Like last year. Well, that's there's no evidence to suggest that did happen. That's not really a false allegation. It's just there's no proof to say it did happen. Um, and there's going to be cases where it's like, oh, but ten years ago he, he, he domestically abused me. You'll notice if you look at the stats, all these allegations of abuse happen after separation. They never happen during. Um, 
And the excuse is always, I was too scared to report it. What you're saying is that you're not too scared to report it now after taking the kids away too. Now you feel safer? Like, How does that work? That's, again, that's my personal opinion. It just it doesn't marry up well at all. If there's genuine domestic abuse, I urge anybody to report it there and then because you, that's the sort of stuff that you need in the future with the current courts that set, set up as evidence which in itself is disgusting because what it suggests is that you need to spend every part of your relationship building up a love profile of your family to make sure that they, you, you can't get called a mental case in the future. Yeah. But yeah, I understand what you're asking. Yeah. And if people want to um, sign this petition for you, mate, where can they find it? Uh, so if you search for deadbeat underscore dadbod1 on Instagram, it can be found on there. If you search for deadbeat.dadbod on pretty much anything, you should find me. It's got my logo and stuff on it. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, what platforms are you on? Uh, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. Yeah, perfect. We'll make sure we obviously put the links in for you, mate, as well, so if people want to follow your journey. Mm -hmm. um, we'll include the Just Giving page and obviously the petition as well. Thank you so um, much. And I think we'll really push that petition, mate, because, you know, we're, we're all about, <laughs> obviously, supporting men, but... Ultimately, just things should be fair, mate. Yeah. And they're obviously not. Um, before we wrap up, mate, because I know you've got to get back on the road soon, um, obviously just like drawing on your experience, um, your lived experience, and obviously the research you've done, everything else, the people you've spoken to. You know, if, there, if there's men watching this that are maybe going through a similar situation, yeah. um, you know, is there anything you want to say to, to wrap up or is there any advice that you would give them? So I mentioned earlier about not really talking about it. Like I was going through possibly the worst mental health you could go through for two solid years. And I didn't speak to anyone about it. Um, and then I actually, this is completely randomly. I bumped into a therapist in my gym. Um, believe it or not, I do go to a gym occasionally. It's just a baggy shirt. Just occasionally, though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I bumped into this guy who said he was a therapist. So he invited me in for a free consultation. I was in there for maybe a minute before I was bawling my eyes out. Um, like just pouring out of me, like all this stuff. And at that point I was like, oh my God, actually talking about it is really helpful. Uh, that incident then led on to me talking to people online, um, seeing other people going through other stuff. And it's just talking. I'm actually part of a community now that it's literally just a, a Discord group that we just talk about what we're going through. And I aim everyone towards that. It's a fantastic setup. And it's literally just people spurting out, having, having an outlet. And, I, and, I, and in this day and age, I mean, that's, mental health has forever been an issue, but it's only now that it's it's actually being concentrated on, which is great. Because if it wasn't for me speaking out, I wouldn't be here. Um, and I, I can say that quite comfortably. I There was no build-up. I didn't warn anyone that I was going to go off and, and, and throw myself off. I was just going to do it. But if I'd spoken to someone beforehand, I wouldn't have even contemplated it. So, yeah, just talking to people. I mean, even as blokes, like I speak to my best mate about stuff and he just takes the piss out of me. But I like that. I like the fact that he can take the piss out of me because he's comfortable with it. Um, but, yeah, speak out. Yeah, and I think, you know, you don't need to pay for a therapist, as you say. If you speak to your mates, I think that's that's massively helpful yeah. as well. And, you know, for any reason, which is often how people feel and it's not correct, but I often feel like a burden doing that. Then obviously you've got the Samaritans at the end of the film. And obviously we've got uh, charities like Andy's Man Club as well, um, who are a sort of a talking group for men that are in a lot of cities. And there's a lot of similar organisations as well. So I think, yeah, I think it's really important that people do talk. Absolutely. Mate, I have got complete admiration um, and respect for what you're doing, mate. Thank you so much. I urge you so much to just keep going um, and get it done. We'll do what we can to, to support, mate. But it's for an amazing cause, not just for you, mate, but for... For, for children mm -hmm. um, who need their dads and obviously guys who want to see their kids. So, mate, keep it going. Well done. Thank you very much. It's exciting, mate. The start of it. So yeah. Can't wait for a year to see where you are. Where yeah. you are. I'll be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah.